the Sunni path. Enemies of Islam have been trying to annihilate Islam since the first Islamic century. As of today, Freemasons, Communists, Jews, and Christians organize various planned attacks. Also, those heretical Muslims who, as it was declared, will go to hell, play tricks and slander the Ahl sunnah the followers of the right way, and mislead Muslims off the true way. Thus, they cooperate with the enemies of Islam in order to demolish the Ahl sunnah These attacks also have been pioneered by the British, who have employed all their imperial resources, treasuries, armed forces, fleets, technology, politicians, and writers in this ignoble war of theirs. So they have demolished the world's two greatest Muslim states that have been protectors of the Ahl sunnah namely the Gurganiya state in India and the Ottoman Islamic Empire, which had extended over three continents. They have annihilated Islam's valuable books in all countries and swept away Islamic teachings from many countries. In the Second World War, communists were about to perish altogether when they received a last-ditch British help sucker, which helped them to regain their strength and spread all over the world. In 1917, British Prime Minister James Balfour established the Zionist Organization, which worked for the re-establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine, a holy place for Muslims, and the continuous support given to this organization by the British government resulted in the establishment of the State of Israel in 1366, Hijri, 1947 of the Christian era. It is the British government again that caused the establishment of the Wahhabite state in 1351, or 1932 of the Christian era, by delivering to the sons of Saud the Arabian Peninsula, which they had grasped from the Ottomans. Thus they dealt the most fatal blow to Islam. Abdurashid Ibrahim Effendi says in a passage entitled The Hostility of the British Towards Islam, in the second volume of the Turkish book alam e islam printed in Istanbul in 1328 history or 1910 of the Christian era, it was the chief aim of the British to abrogate the caliphate of Muslims as soon as possible. It was a plot arranged by them to encourage Crimean Turks to revolt against the Ottoman state so that they could demolish the caliphate. Their secret and tricky intention was seen clearly through the Treaty of Paris. They exposed the hostility in their hearts and the propositions which they made in the Lausanne Treaty, which was held in 1923. Whatever the disguise, all the disasters that fell upon the Turks were always caused by the British. To destroy Islam has ever been the main political aim of British politicians, for they have always feared Islam. They have been using mercenary consciences to deceive Muslims. These treacherous and hypocritical people are presented by the British as Islamic scholars. In short, the greatest enemy of Islam are the British. Not only were Muslim countries stained with blood by the British for hundreds of years, but also Scotch Freemasons deceived thousands of Muslims and religious men, made them Freemasons, and through such falsities as helping humanity, brotherhood, caused them to dissent from Islam and become apostates willingly. In order to annihilate Islam thoroughly, they used these Masonic apostates as tools. Thus, Freemasons such as Mustafa Rashid Pasha, Ali Pasha, Fuad Pasha, Midhat Pasha, and Talat Pasha were used to demolish Islamic states. Freemasons such as Jamal al-Din al-Afghani, Muhammad Abdu, and novices trained by them were the cat's paws in defiling and annihilating Islamic knowledge. Of the hundreds of destructive and subversive books written by these masons who occupied religious posts, the book Muhawarat by the Egyptian Rashid Rida was translated into many languages and distributed in Islamic countries. With this method, they have been trying to defile Muslims' religion and faith. And it is seen that those young religious men who have not read or understood the books of the scholars of Ahl Sunnah, have been seized by this current and pushed into perdition, and have also brought perdition to others. The book Muhawarat attacks the four madhabs of the Ahl Sunnah, denies Ijma al Ummah, one of the four sources of Islamic knowledge, and says that everybody should act upon what he deduces from the book, i.e., Quran al Karim and the Sunnah, i.e. Hadith al-Sharifs. Thus, it attempts to exterminate Islamic teachings. It is stated at the end of the book Khulasat al-Takik that a Muslim either has become a mushtahid or has not reached the grade of ishtihad. A mushtahid is either mutlaq, absolute, or mukayyad, affiliated to a madhab. It is not permissible for a mushtahid mutlaq to follow another mushtahid. He has to follow his own ishtihad. 
However, it is wajib for a mujtahid muqayyad to follow the methods of the madhab of a mujtahid mutlaq, and he acts upon his own ishtihad, which he employs in accordance with these methods. Non-mujtahids should follow whichever one they choose of the four madhabs. However, when doing an act in accordance with a certain madhab, they have to observe all the conditions required by that madhab for it to be sahih. If they do not observe even one of the conditions, their act of worship will not be sahih. It has been unanimously stated that such an act will be in vain, batil. Although they do not have to believe that their madhab is superior, they had better believe so. Talfiq, that is, to do any worship or any act in accordance with the rules of more than one madhabs that disagree with one another, or, to put it more clearly, to select eclectically those rules of these madhabs which disagree with one another in performing that worship, means to go out of the four madhabs and to make up a fifth madhab. This worship will not be sahih in any of the madhabs mixed with one another. It will be in vain and will mean to make a game of Islam. For example, if some najasa has been dropped into a certain amount of water of less than haud kabir and more than kulatain, and if the color, taste, or odor of the water has not changed, and if a person performs ablution with this water without intending formally, niya, to perform an ablution, and if he does not wash certain parts of his body in the prescribed succession, and if he does not rub his hands gently against them, and if he does not wash them one right after another, and if he begins his ablution without saying the bismillah, his ablution will not be sahih according to any of the four aimat al-madahib. He who says that it is sahih will have made up a fifth madhab. Even a mujtahid cannot suggest a fifth opinion, disagreeing with the unanimity of the four madhabs. The amount of water equaling a qulatain is explained in detail in the seventh chapter of the fourth fascicle of the book Endless Bliss. Sadr al-Shariya writes in his book Tawdih, when two different reports concerning something were transmitted from the Sahabat al-Kiram, the posterior scholars were not permitted to propose a third one according to unanimity. There are also those scholars who say that the scholars of every century would be like the Sahabat al-Kiram. Mullah Khusra ta'ala, wrote in his book Mirat al-Usul, when two different reports about doing something were transmitted from the scholars of the first century, it is not permissible, according to unanimity of scholars, to suggest a third report. It is sahih to say that the scholars of every century were like the Sahabat al-Kiram. Jalaluddin al-Mihali, the first author of the tafsir book al-Jalalain, says in the commentary to Jam al-Jawami by as it is haram to disagree with ijma, consensus of Islamic scholars. It is prohibited in the Quran al-Karim. For that reason, it is haram to express a third opinion about something on which the Salaf al-Salihin disagreed. One's doing an act of worship by following rules of the two, three, or four madhabs disagreeing with one another is disobedience to the ijma of these madhabs. Such an act of worship will not be sahih in any of these madhabs. In other words, talfiq is not permissible. Qasim ibn Qatlubaga writes in At-Tashih, it is unanimously stated that it is not sahih to do an act of worship by following two different ishtihads. For this reason, if a person while performing an ablution does not rub his wet hands over all his head, and if then a dog touches him and then he performs namaz, his namaz will not be sahih or valid. It is also written in the book Tawfiq al-Hukam by Shihab al-Din Ahmed ibn al-Imad, ta'ala, a Shafi scholar, that such a namaz will be wrong according to the unanimity. According to Imam Malik and Al-Imam Ashafi, ta'ala, the ablution and namaz of such a person will not be sahih because he did not rub his wet hands on his whole head, which is one of the fards of ablution according to the former imam, and he touched a dog, which makes his ablution null and void according to the latter. Muhammad al-Baghdadi, ta'ala, a Hanafi scholar, writes in his book entitled Taqlid, there are three stipulations to be fulfilled for imitating another madhab. The first one, which is also written in Ibn Humam in his work Tahrir, is that a person cannot finish in another madhab an act of worship which he began in accordance with his own madhab. For example, he cannot perform namaz in accordance with the Shafi madhab with an ablution, which he performed in accordance with the Hanafi madhab. The second stipulation, as quoted by Ibn Humam in his Tahrir, 
from Ahmed ibn Idris al-Karafi, is that the act of worship he is doing should not be judged to be invalid by both of the madhabs he is following. If he, while performing an ablution, follows the Shafi madhab and does not rub his hand on those parts of the body he has to wash in an ablution, and then he, if he touches a woman he is permitted to marry, thinking his ablution will not break by doing so according to the Maliki madhab, the namaz he performs with this ablution will not be sahih according to either madhab. The third stipulation is that one should not seek after the rukhsas of the madhabs or easier ways in doing acts of worship versus azmats, which are harder but better ways. Imam al-Nawawi and many other scholars emphasized the importance of this stipulation. Imam Humam did not state this stipulation. Hassan Ash-Shunblali writes in his Al-Iqt al-Farid, Nikah performed without the presence of the wali, guardian of either of the would-be couple who is not yet pubescent, by following the Hanafi madhab, or that which is performed without the presence of eyewitnesses by following the Maliki madhab, will be sahih. However, the nikah performed with the absence of both the guardian and the eyewitness will not be sahih, because it would be very difficult for the common people to observe this third stipulation they have been prohibited to imitate another madhab unless there is a daurura to do so. A daururat is a situation which hinders one from performing an act of worship which is farz in one's own madhab, or from avoiding something which is haram in one's madhab, and which one cannot help. It has been said that it will not be sahih to imitate another madhab without consulting an Islamic scholar. At this point, we end our quotation from Muhammad Baghdadi. Mm-hmm.